a single instance when there were as many people in the audience as tonight. And that pleases us and evidences the fact on your part that you're here because of your interest in the work of the Lord and your desire to share with us in the blessings and joys that characterize this service. And I entertain the hope that it may be a profitable occasion and that from the lesson presented, you'll find edification and so at its end, be glad you came. I cannot overemphasize the fact that this is the purpose of all such efforts, it is to teach God's word, to enable people to know more about what is there found, that they may be able to incorporate in their own lives and thus practice it from day to day. I can assure you that it's only thus that you'll ever get to heaven, because only by a faithful, godly life, a life dedicated to the service of our Savior and pursued diligently to the end, will enable you one day to sweep through the gates of San John and enter into the blessings and privileges so marvelous and wonderful that they are beyond our finite imagination, but for which we can, of course, well afford to labor and wait. Such is our aim and our intention in this service as in all such. In our Lord's intercessory prayer, found in John 17, among other things, he said this, to know God is eternal life. Quite obviously, to know God involves more than a recognition of his existence, or for that matter, the characteristics that are his, are the facts, historic facts, that are involved with reference to his existence and his relationship to the world. It involves, of course, an acknowledgement of his fatherhood, a willingness to accept his will and obedience thereto because of our relationship to him as sons to a father. And of course, eternal life suggests that endless existence that is to characterize the faithful when this life is over. And so it's important for us all to know God. Were I do not to ask you well, who is God, or what is God? Well, I think we might have some difficulty in providing a simple definition. We speak about him often, and of course read about him regularly in the sacred writing. But were we called upon to give a definition of God, or to answer the simple question, who or what is God, what would we say? Well, I hope the matter will be clearer and more comprehensive to you when we finish this evening than now. In the first place, note this. The word God, as used in the Bible, is the name of the divine nature. That's the reason why we read of but one God in the Bible. It's because there is but one divine nature. Someone might have a bit of a problem with that on the ground that Christ the Son possesses it, as well as the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit. And so might say, how can the Bible teach that there is but one God when we read of three persons in the Godhead? God the Father, Christ the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The answer is, the word God names the nature, the divine nature. There is but one such nature. Hence, there is but one God. But there are three persons possessing that one nature, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And each in the Bible, under a figure which grammarians call the synecdoche, where a part may stand with the whole, and the whole for a part, are called God in the Bible, often the Father, an instance of which 
will be found in that familiar statement, John 3 and 16, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. There, the word God, used distinctively and individually of the first person of Godhead. But then on other occasions, the Son is called God, a familiar example of which is found in John chapter 1, verse 1, which reads, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the same was in the beginning with God. Then further, without him was nothing made that is made. All things were made by him. Evidencing the fact that our Lord, the second person of the Godhead, was actually the creator of the world. I think most people have never got around to recognizing that fact. Were we to ask, who is the creator? Well, I think most would say, the first person of the Godhead, the Father, but quite the contrary. The Bible plainly and distinctly declares that it was our Lord, Jesus Christ our Lord, who created the earth. Look at it. All things were made by him, and without him, that is Christ, was not anything made that was made. No further that he's here also identified as God. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And further, in the same context, as far down as verse 14, we are told that the Word was made flesh and dwelt among men. So there can be no doubt touching the identity of the Word in that passage. And the allusion there to his existence and to his identity as possessing the divine nature. And so, the second person is sometimes called God in the Bible. In like manner, sometimes the Holy Spirit is called God in the Bible. We have an example of this in Acts chapter 5, verses 3 and 4, when in the instance of the effort of Ananias and Sapphira to practice deception on their early church, and being this, uh, exposed by fear, the apostle said, Who put it in your heart to lie unto the Holy Spirit? And then in that same context, he said, You've not lied to men, you've lied to God. And so there, the word God and the Holy Spirit, uh, the terms are used interchangeably. And so the Holy Spirit is also called God in the Bible. Thus it's entirely in order quite in keeping with biblical phraseology to talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. How many gods? One. Why? Because that's the name of the divine nature. But how many possess that nature? Three. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's evidence in the very first verse of the first chapter of the Bible. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. It's interesting that the word God there translates a Hebrew word, the word Elohim, which is the plural form of one of the words that describe God in the Old Testament. And so the text here alludes to the three persons of the Godhead in the word God there. Now note carefully. While the subject of the sentence, God created, is plural, the verb of the passage, created, by in Hebrew, is singular. We have this remarkable circumstance of a plural subsidy or noun for the subject and a singular predicate or verb involved with a noun that is plural in nature. A plural subject, a singular predicate, suggesting plurality in unity, the suggestion of three persons in one Godhead, the design of which is to achieve the person and the, and the purpose of that which is involved 
in creation and in redemption. Further, note the plural pronouns that are often used in connection with deity in the Bible. For example, we read in Genesis chapter 1, verse 26, and God said, now watch, who said it? And God said, let us make man in our own image. And after our own likeness, what? Let us, not the plural pronoun. God said, let us make man in our own image and after our own likeness. And so we have again here evidence of the plurality in the Godhead. The Father, of course, is first indicated to us in the Bible, but invisible beyond the ability of man to see. You're familiar with, with such statements as this. No man has seen God at any time. Obviously here, the word God alludes to the first person. Quite obviously, people saw Jesus, but then there was one whom people could not see, and that was the first person. Now, suppose that there had been no further revelation. Suppose that there had been nothing further for man to be able to determine the nature of deity. How could he find out? You remember after the fall, man was never allowed to approach God directly. Always after the fall, between the sinless being of God and the sinful being of man was always a sinless intermediary. In the early dispensations, it was a lamb without spot and without blemish. Under the present age, it's still a lamb. The Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And so watch, had there been no further revelation of God to man, why people might have claimed that God is unknown. How can you know a God you can't see, that you cannot approach, who is absolutely beyond the apprehension of man? Why men might have excused themselves for not being submissive to his will on the ground that he was unapproachable and unknown. But then, in the fullness of time, our Lord came into the world, the purpose of which was to reveal God to man. We read, for example, in Hebrews, the first chapter and the third verse, that he is the express image of the Father. Note it, what please. Note the words particularly, express image. They translate a Greek word that means literally the imprint of the stem on the white page. Take a rubber stem, place it upon the white page, and it transmits to the page an exact replica of itself. Our Lord is the replica of the stem. God is revealed in Christ our Lord. In John 1 and 14, he came to declare the Father. The word declare there translates a term that means literally interpret him. That is, our Lord is the interpreter of the Father. He possessed all the attributes that the Father did. That's why we read in John 14 that to see him was to see the Father. Not, of course, as actually of the Father, but as representatively of him, that men might in Christ see the characteristics that the Father had. We read in Colossians chapter 2, verse 9, in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. That means he had every characteristic that the Father possessed, and thus revealed God the man. Now of this largely introductory to what I want to emphasize this evening with reference to the revealed character of our Lord. Why long thought that we have a far, far too limited concept of the revealed life of our Lord in the sacred writing. Nine times out of ten, when somebody speaks of the life of Christ, they think in large measure of his earthly existence. When men preach sermons on the life of Christ, it has to do with the period of time between his birth of the Virgin and perhaps his ascension. When men write lesson material or prepare books on the life of Christ, it's that limited portion that has to do in large measure with his public ministry. Why, friends, that's only the smallest portion of the revealed life of our Lord. 
and shall not do no more tonight than to brought your perspective of your Savior. Why it would be worth a hundred such efforts as this? There are not one, but five different aspects. And I hope you'll make a mental or otherwise a note of each. And thus leave this place tonight better informed in what it means to accept our Lord as he indeed is the revealed Savior of the world. Number one, there would be a consideration of him in his pre-existent state before time began in the eternity that preceded the beginning as indicated in Genesis 1. Remember that we saw that he's called the Word. Why the Word? Bear in mind that a Word is an expression of an idea. It is the vehicle that conveys the idea. And since we've seen that the Lord came for the purpose of revealing God to man, he is that Word. He is the expression of that idea. And thus is so designated in the sacred writing. Of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses are in grave error in their contention that our Lord is himself a created being. Why, he was there when creation began. No. If the Lord, who is himself the creator, was there when the creation began, then he wasn't created. For he who was there when creation started was not created, and so he animates creation and was there before it began. If he was there before it began, he didn't begin with it. Hence, he is older than creation, and thus eternal in nature. Thus, any consideration of the life of our Lord would involve a consideration of him in the eternity that precedes the beginning of the Bible record and stretches back endlessly as we today feebly attempt to comprehend what eternity involves. Then secondly, there would be a foreshadowing of him in the Old Testament. Note it now, there are many references to our Lord, I'm talking of the second person of the Godhead, in the Old Testament. You remember the three angels that came to the tent of Abraham? How that one of those angels was called the angel of Jehovah? How later the phrase angel always dropped in the text? how he was simply called Jehovah, and Abraham worshipped him. A created being is not a subject of worship, problem. This being was indeed worthy of such worship. He was not a created being. Do you remember in Paul's statement in 1 Corinthians 10, of the Israelites in the wilderness, and the rock that followed them was Christ? Christ back there in the wilderness 1,500 years before he came to the earth in the form of flesh as a result of the birth of the Virgin Mary. Well, I get it, friends. Our Lord made many trips to this earth before he was born of the Virgin Mary and took upon himself the form of flesh. As a matter of fact, in some instances, the word Jehovah in the Old Testament has reference not to the first person of the Godhead, as we almost exclusively use it today, but to the second person. Let me give a classic example. In Isaiah 40 and verse 2, we have that prophecy of one who would appear as the forerunner or the harbinger and make straight in the pathway or in the desert a pathway for Jehovah. But in the third chapter of Matthew, the Holy Spirit takes that prophecy and interprets it as applying to Christ as the one who was the harbinger and who made the way for Jesus. So there is an instance of where the Holy Spirit said that in Isaiah 40, the word Jehovah has reference to the second verse of the God. Jesus Christ, our Lord. So, secondly, we would consider him in our study of the life of Christ as his foreshadowing in the Old Testament. Thirdly, his life incarnate 
in flesh here on earth, having been born into the human family by the Virgin Mary, living for a period of approximately 33 years as an individual here upon earth, deity incarnate in the flesh, subjected to all the temptations of the characteristic of the world, living a life, an example of which we may follow safely and surely. And of all the great characters that have ever lived, there's never been one that approached him. Has it ever occurred to you this, that no one has ever been able properly to point a single finger of scorn at our Savior? Some years ago, some man somewhere made an offer of $1,000 in cash to anybody who could show one worthy deed in our Lord's life. Why, he might as well have made his offer a billion dollars. Even infidels have tied one or another in ascribing to our Lord a purity and a godly character unmatched and unheard of otherwise. The Lord is our example as he lived upon this earth. But then, fourthly, we would consider him in his glorified state. I think one of the most thrilling statements in the Old Testament, and I hope I may introduce this to you and then you'll ponder it further. In the 24th Psalm, David, a thousand years before it happened, described our Lord's entrance into heaven on the occasion of his ascension after he left this earth on the clouds of heaven. He saw it prophetically. He described it prophetically a thousand years before he died. He tells us that as he drew near the eternal city, that the announcement was made, swing wide ye gates and open your everlasting doors, and the king of glory shall come in. Those on the inside ask, who is the king of glory? And the announcement came, the Lord of hosts, he is king of glory. And thus the gates of heaven opened, and our Lord entered. And as we learn from subsequent history, on the first Pentecost following his resurrection, he was crowned king of kings and lord of lords. He led captivity captive, and he gave gifts to men. He dispatched his spirit to the earth, and it became the director and guide of his chosen apostles, and he took his seat as his coronation occasion on that day on David's throne. From henceforth he sits expecting under his enemies, under the footstool of his feet. As a matter of fact, we're told in the Bible how long that reign will continue. In 1 Corinthians 15, beginning at verse 23, every man in his own order, Christ the first roots, Afterwards, they their Christ at his coming. Note, if you will, the subject, the coming of Christ. Well, what next? Note it carefully. Every man in his own order, Christ the first fruits. Afterwards, they that are Christ at his coming. Then cometh the end. Well, what will characterize the end? Look at it. But he shall have delivered up the kingdom to God, even the Father. For he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. His last enemy is there. Note it now. Our Lord is now reigning. That reign is continuing uninterruptedly for nearly 2,000 years. That reign will continue until his enemies are destroyed. His last enemy to be destroyed is death. Death will be destroyed in the resurrection. Hence our Lord must reign until the resurrection. At which time, then, point number five will begin. He will abdicate in favor of his Father, and through the eternity that is yet to come, will be our elder brother, with whom we'll be privileged to be associated through endless ages. Look at it, please. The pre-existent Christ before time began. The Christ of the Old Testament. The Christ incarnate in flesh. The glorified Christ in God's right hand. And then the Christ of the eternity yet to come as our elder brother. 
I think this lesson wouldn't be complete, and I've already exhausted as much time as I normally preach. But I must take a few more moments <coughs> to deal with the subject of the Holy Spirit, who is equally dear, who also is a part of the Godhead, and who likewise has styled God on occasion under the figure of the the Cave and the Bible. It's tragic that there's so much error in the world tonight about the third person of Godhead. There are too many of our preachers today who are getting some of their education in denominational seminaries, who are drinking too deeply of the wells of denominational theology, and who are picking up these concepts from these men and are now propagating them in congregations of our people. I will obligate myself to show that while there has been some differences through the years as to the nature of so-called inviting of the Holy Spirit, there was not a man of prominence among us who ever taught until in the last 25 or 30 years that the Holy Spirit exercised an influence apart from an independent of the Word of God. Our brethren have always thought until the last quarter of a century or so that the Word is all sufficient, that it meets our every need, and hence to argue that the Holy Spirit must in some fashion direct us apart from an independent of that Word is pure and simple denominational theology. Some of us that have engaged frequently in debates in years past with denominational theologians defended the truth against the very doctrines that now some preachers in the churches of Christ are now advocating. They tell us that we need the Holy Spirit's help in being able to understand the Word. But the Spirit illuminates and makes clear that Word. To illuminate is to make brighter. But it was the Spirit who gave the Word in the outset. Apparently then, in the concept of these men, it was not made sufficiently clear. It has an obscurity that we cannot deal with without additional help today. And so the Spirit must then remedy the defect that characterizes his original revelation so we can understand what he invented us to know to begin with. But if that's the case, how do we know that the illumination illuminates? Maybe we need an illumination of the illumination of the illumination of the illumination that illuminates. Where do we stop? That view, friends, is a reflection on the all-sufficiency of the Word of God. Second Timothy 3, all scriptures inspired of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. I'm quoting now from the American Standard Version. That the man of God may be complete, look at it, completely furnished on every good work. There are two ideas there. I mentioned this earlier in another connection. I want to emphasize it again. That the man of God may be complete, I don't know one. Completely furnished under every good work, I don't know two. Which means, number one, it meets my every need, providing me with all the information necessary to my obligation to my ultimate salvation. But secondly, it puts in my hand an instrument that is totally adequate to the discharge of my duty to all others. It not only fits me, it outfits me. And these efforts to make it appear that the Word must have additional light in order to our ability to understand it is a dangerous doctrine. The first generation, too weak to accept its consequences, avoids the Pentecostal root. The second, third, and fourth generation will easily adopt it. It is the preliminary steps lead to the concept. I urge you, friends, to recognize that it's a dangerous doctrine, that it's an innovation that comes from denominational seminaries rather than from the New Testament. Are you here tonight? 
have not bound to the teaching of the New Testament or have been led by the Spirit. Romans 8 and 14, as many as are led by the Spirit of the sons of God. This informs us that we're led by the Spirit in being and becoming and being sons of God. Well, how do we know how to become sons of God? The only information we have on that subject is in the New Testament. But when we follow that teaching, we're told in Romans 8 and 14 that we're being led by the Spirit. So how much clearer does it make the way? It simply says that the way the Spirit leads us is by His teaching, which is in the New Testament. And when you obey that teaching, you're being led by the Spirit. When you disregard that teaching, you are disregarding and disobeying the Holy Spirit. Be a Christian, you must believe the Gospel of Hebrews 11, 6. You must repent of your sins, Luke 13, 3. You must confess your faith to the Lord, on the time. You must be baptized, our Savior said, Mark 16, 16. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. More than this, you are not required to do to become a Christian. I'll tell you solemnly, less than this you can't do and become a Christian. These are the indispensable conditions. These are the steps of salvation. Having so done, the Lord led you to the church. The one, of course, of which you read in the Bible. In fact, for therein you live the realm of your days. Heaven will ultimately be your home. Why not begin the journey tonight? You have obeyed him with a wonder and penitence return. Claim his awful part and know again the joy of salvation. I cannot urge you with stronger incentives than I have presented tonight to take that step. Won't you come tonight as we stand and sing some <laughs>